introductions first of all of our facilitators for this webinar. And then we will jump into some housekeeping um, before starting our presentation for the webinar today. So I'll start with the introductions um, first. So my name is Carolyn McRae and I work as a postdoc at the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, at Queen's. And my main roles are working on active learning as well as our grad student and TA focused programming at the Center. Uh, Andy, do you want to go next? Yep. Hi, Andy Leger. Good morning and good afternoon for those in the UK. Uh, I'm an educational developer in the Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, primary responsibility is around active learning, active learning classrooms, as well as uh, educational technology and on cue. Thanks for being part of this. Lilith, you're up next. Can't hear ya. There we go. Classic mistake. Uh, my name is Lilith Wyatt. I am in the Experiential Learning Hub here at Queen's um, as a project coordinator and primarily um, consult with faculty and course instructors around experiential learning course development and program development. Great, thank you. And Ruth. Hello everyone, I'm Ruth Rosita and I'm the Experiential Learning Manager at the BISC and at the BISC I look after the extension learning, programming, curriculum, etc. That's great. So just a few housekeeping um, that we're going to start with for the webinar today. Um, we'd like everyone participants to mute their microphones, um, which it looks like most of you have. Um, as well, you can turn off your camera for the duration of the presentation. So we will be sharing our screen and some slides with you today. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Um, and so it will be available um, after the fact on our website. Um, if you would like to ask a question throughout the webinar, feel free to use the chat box and we'll be checking back with the uh, questions that come in through the chat periodically. Uh, if you find the chat for you is distracting, you can feel free to turn it off. Um, turning on and off the chat feature um, is the little kind of speech bubble icon that's on your main toolbar in Teams. If you're looking for captioning for the webinar today, there is an auto caption option. If you click on the three little bubbles um, in your more, more actions part of the toolbar, uh, there's an option for you to turn on your captioning. OK, so from here, I think we're going to start our presentation. All right, is everyone able to see the slides? Yes, all right. Um, okay. So I start many of my classes and my workshops on campus with an acknowledgement of the land that we're on when we are on main campus. Um, and so I think in a webinar, it's no different. We just are on different land. Um, so Queen's University itself is situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. And while most of us may not be on the main campus at Queen's today, this is a time that we can all reflect upon the history and the land that we are on and what this land means to us or what this land has been able to provide to us. Um, and so the picture of the robin's eggs is because I have a nest right outside my window um, with robin's eggs on it today. So for this webinar today, we're going to start with a general conversation about active learning and transitioning some of your elements of your course to this remote teaching and learning environment. Specifically, we'll be talking about building active learning into seminars, labs, and other experiential learning opportunities. We'll hear from uh, the Experiential Learning Hub, as well as an example from uh, what they're doing around experiential learning at the BISC, at the Castle. And lastly, Caroline, we'll talk. So, yeah, the only thing I'll add is that there will be an opportunity for questions besides the chat. So if anybody yes. has it at the end, then you can definitely we'll share at that point. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Andy. All right. So the first thing we wanted to talk about were some guiding principles for active learning. So Andy, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. I mean, these are some things that we thought would be helpful to talk about, and we would share these with anybody that was thinking about engaging in active learning, whether it be in a lecture, whether it be in the active learning classroom, uh, whether it be online. So these are the principles that in a consultation or in working with faculty members, we would we would walk them through and have them think about. So we wanted to draw attention to these sort of in the beginning of this webinar, such that we have them in our mind as we start to think about, all right, 
these also apply as we move into the, this remote environment. So, and, and they're not necessarily difficult concepts, but the idea being is that as you think about these non lecture style types of experiences, you need to be careful that you're selecting them for a very specific reason, that you're focusing on the key learning outcomes or the key experiences you want your students to have, so that you're not just choosing them just for the sake of it, but there's a clear purpose in mind. The second thing, of course, is that we need to be very mindful of explaining to students why this is important why we're having them do it, uh, how it's connected to the course, what you've done in the past, what's coming up, what the assessments are, those kinds of things. So students aren't left with, you know, why are we doing this? I think this is actually particularly germane in this, in this uh, remote environment that we be very careful to be perhaps over the top with respect to this because you don't have the same touch points with students throughout uh, that you may. So really think about how you're going to onboard your students to a particular activity or experience. Um, as we you would do in class, if you had an active learning uh, activity going on, you would check in with the students, you'd filter around, you'd talk to them, you'd answer questions. I think we need to be sure that there's opportunities to do that when we start thinking about all these other events that we're creating. Um, give feedback how students are doing. And then finally, I think it's important that these things aren't left hanging, that you debrief with the students, once again, why they did it, what the purpose was, you know, circle back to the learning outcomes you're trying to cover. So students are left with, okay, now what? What, what, what do I need to get out of this and how does it apply or something in the future? So uh, we just wanted to uh, make sure that we highlight those again, such that, again, we'll touch base on them as we go forward. But for now, I think it's important to really think about these things. Back to you, Carolyn. So when we start to think about what changes we might make to our course as we are considering um, the ways we're going to engage students in this remote teaching and learning environment. Um, I have kind of three questions that uh, I've been thinking about and that I pose to you when you are considering the, you know, how you're going to look at your labs and your seminars and your other activities in your course. And so the first is really about what is the intended meaning of this activity and what learning outcomes does it um, speak to? And so really, um, and that just comes back to this course alignment of why why are you doing the activity? Number two is what skills do you expect students to practice and understand by doing um, the seminar, the tutorial, the lab? And how might the alternate activities achieve the same desired outcomes? So not necessarily thinking about how can you duplicate your face to face activity in a remote environment, but how might you adapt so that students have the same type of learning experience, but maybe in a bit of a different method? So we're going to go into some ideas and some strategies for seminars and tutorials, as well as lab sessions, um, and then some experiential learning uh, opportunities. So we'll start first by talking about seminars and tutorials. And I think the question that I tend to ask myself here is what is the purpose of the seminar or tutorial? Because that might look quite different depending on the discipline, the type of course. If it is just a seminar course versus a seminar that's part of a larger course. Um, so what's the purpose? And so along the left hand side of the chart here, I have some ideas of what seminars are often used for on campus. So sometimes they're about generating discussions, maybe about the readings from that week. Sometimes they're about problem sets or solving uh, cases. Uh, they can be about review of lecture content from that particular week, and the TA might be there to answer some questions. Um, or go through some kind of muddy points that came up during the week. Or it could be about applying the content in a completely new way um, and bringing up new information that students are getting. So I think of thinking about the purpose of your seminar is really important when you're trying to decide how you're going to bring this into the remote environment. So for example, if the purpose of your seminar is about generating discussion, you might think about how you're going to use discussion boards in OnCue to facilitate this. And this might mean breaking students into smaller groups to use discussion boards in OnQ, um, where a TA is able to either move between uh, discussion boards and help facilitate that conversation, or about bringing a large group discussion within your whole class um, that happens in OnQ. Um, if it's about something like problem so solving or showing how to 
um, work through a particular uh, solution, you might think about a TA recording a video and demonstrating how to work through a particular problem. And this, this brings in the question of designing some asynchronous activities that students can access at any time throughout their week, not necessarily at a particular um, time where they have to be live on the computer. You can think about um, reviewing lecture material by a TA maybe hosting a synchronous question and answer session. So if you really want students to have that opportunity to ask questions, get feedback, um, have some discussion with their peers and with the TA um, about what would happen in lecture that week, um, that might be the way you think about designing your seminar. Or it might be about creating group work opportunities um, that are facilitated by a TA. So either asynchronously um, or through some synchronous sessions that a TA can help um, answer questions. Um, but I think it's really about aligning the purpose of your seminar with the type of activity that you design. And there are a few things that I would consider when thinking about your seminar design. And one of the big ones is how are you going to build community within your class and within your seminar groups? Um, I think this is going to be really important, especially in some of the larger first and second year classes, because the seminars are often that opportunity for students to get to know their peers, to have these small group interactions um, where they're able to build that network with their friends, um, their kind of study mates. Um, and so how are you going to do that in the remote environment? Um, so there's a comment in the chat here. In Teams, TAs and instructors cannot move between breakout rooms. They can't in Teams. It's something that is available in Zoom, um, but there's other ways you can facilitate it um, in Teams. So if you're doing some type of group work, um, you can break students down into their own groups and ask them to create their own team in Teams where they can chat, they can file share, and a TA can uh, be invited into that group so that they can communicate um, with the particular groups as they're doing group work. Just not as easy as kind of breakout rooms live like you can do in Zoom. My understanding is teams, is they're working on that and it's something that it's possible, but I would never guarantee that it's going to be implemented for the summer. I think they recognize, teams does, Microsoft, that that's in a function of Zoom that's desirable. So they're, they're going to work on that, but at this particular time, it's not elegant. Yeah, the other question coming into the chat right now is about support for instructors that are using Zoom breakout rooms. Um, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but ITS is going to be supporting Zoom in some capacity. Yes, yeah, Zoom um, and Microsoft Team and Zooms are will be the supported um, software to, for this particular function. Both will be supported. So yes, there will be support. I would start with IT services and then come perhaps come back to the CTL if you're having issues. Um, so the other uh, consideration that I have here is about what guidance and support are you going to give students to ensure success? So I think that you're going to get some questions from students about the expectations around um, seminars and contributions and how do we expect students to engage in these parts of our course? And so I think having some direct and clear guidelines will really help students to figure out when and how they're able to ask questions of a TA. Is it supposed to be an email to a TA? Is it by coming to a synchronous session or a discussion board in on queue? And having that clarity will help students know the function of your seminar and what the function um, of the TA is in other capacities. So I've been talking about TAs a lot. This is something that I work on at the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I think that they're a really valuable piece of your teaching team. And so we have to remember too that our TAs are going to be probably teaching in a, this remote or online world for the first time as well. Um, and so understanding what we need to help our TAs to help them succeed. Um, so giving them the clear expectations as well as what you're expecting from students and how you're expecting your TAs to facilitate these types of sessions. Uh, technology might be new to some of these students acting as TAs. Um, and so being clear on how to use the technology and where to turn for help would be really important. Um, at the center, we have a couple great resources that will be coming very soon for TAs. So one is a graduate student toolkit that we're developing that will be focused on TAing in all different aspects of TA ships. And that should be launching in the next few weeks. And then in late August, early September, we'll be having our teaching development day. 
Um, and that will be actually happening over the course of a number of days. And an announcement on the dates and the format will be coming out probably within the next week. So stay tuned for that. But these are great professional development opportunities that you can offer for your TAs in where they can turn to ask questions and get some help um, on their TA ship as well. Maybe I'll answer to uh, reply to David's question in the chat. Uh, I mean, David, I think you have to defer to what your your faculty is saying. However, my understanding is is that yes, we're discouraging, or there's an element of discouragement of having large synchronous events like redoing your lectures, for example, with your entire group. But my understanding is having synchronous events with smaller groups of students, like seminars or tutorials may be something that would be more encouraged and uh, supported. Now, mindful of, you're right, there is disadvantage because of timing and where that could be. And to mitigate that or help with that, the suggestion is, is that you have one of the tutorials of the small group breakout perhaps at a time that would be um, suitable to those that are in different time zones. So one of the tutorials, for example, might be late in the evening or even at 1 a.m. and you have one TA that likes to stay up all night and chooses to be the TA for that particular one. So I think there's um, I think there needs to be some clarity about, yes, perhaps not large synchronous ones, but uh, the smaller tutorial type things, I think, um, could be a valuable part to those large courses because those are the touch points and places for students to get the experiences that um, that Carolyn's speaking about. Now, uh, Max has asked a question, what do you mean by small groups? And again, this is a suggestion. If you have a group work, you want a group to work on a project, so just a group. I think groups of five are the types that if you want a meaningful group function to come up with a project, five or so is something you can actually work well with. Now, if we're talking about tutorials or seminars, I think groups of 10 are the, the sizes that we should be um, encouraged to look for. Again, having 10 people online synchronously to answer if, if we're thinking about this synchronously you can actually have a, a conversation and get to know the 10 people and have engagement i think if you get beyond that like 20 like we would normally have i think that's very difficult to get all students involved but that's my suggestion max i hope that helps carolyn do you want to add anything yeah no i think that sounds great and i think the the difficult challenge might depend also on how large your course is and if tutorials and seminars have to be a specific size, um, just based on, yeah. you know, if you're if you're running a 300 person first year course, um, so there will be limitations based on your course size. Yeah, that's fair. But optimally, that's where you. I think this online is different, obviously, than face to face. So less would be better. And then, David, I hope that answers your question. But really, clarity needs to be sought, sought out from your faculty office. But that's my understanding. Um, from the VPTL's perspective, is that some synchronous is fine uh, as long as it's not something that is required for everybody at the same time, um, as long as there's options. Okay, I think I get to transition to labs. So labs are one of those things I think is, is, is difficult to get our heads around and think, how are we going to do these things where normally we're at a bench or we're together in a room or something like that? And that is absolutely true. This I think this is a difficult thing to uh, to transition onto into remote. That being said, it's not impossible. Um, again, we come back to, and maybe perhaps we're, we're, we keep saying this, but what is it that you're hoping to accomplish um, from a lab? So we need to be really careful and really clear about what the learning outcomes are for the labs in your particular course. And then, of course, you have to think, okay, this is what I'm hoping to accomplish. How can I best achieve that or at least get close to it in other ways? Things like whether the students do need to work independently or whether they need to work in a group will then need to come to mind because that will change uh, your design and how you implement it. And then finally, the big thing is, I think, is gathering those resources, those softwares, the instructions, the, um, the lab kits, whatever it might be in order to make it possible. So I'll get you to move on. So if you think about learning outcomes, if you think about why we have labs, I mean, these are some, but obviously not all. There are different elements to what we try to accomplish uh, when we have students work on labs. And they range from, you know, reviewing, analyzing to building or designing and 
to applying and practicing laboratory te techniques, perhaps that's the one that I would highlight that gets more difficult. But if that's one of the ones, then that's the one you need to think about or communicating your findings. So again, these are examples of outcomes, learning outcomes you can have for your course, uh, for your lab. And depending on which ones you're focusing on, it will change uh, how you may then transition this to the remote environment. I'll get you to go on, Carolyn. Okay. So you can ask yourselves then, based on the learning outcomes, how can I achieve this another way? Can students um, gain what they need to do um, by watching the experiment as opposed to actually doing it? So can they at least understand, not understand, at least uh, gather data by watching? Can they uh, at least um, simulate or see uh, the, the experimental protocol by watching? Um, instead of actually having students at the, at the lab doing it, can they create or design another experiment that they can do at home? And then finally, the last thing is, if, if need be, um, could we transition fully to having the labs that we did have to a simulated or a virtual session? So there's elements of watching, there's elements of doing, but doing at home. And then there's finally, there's the element of doing, but doing it virtually with a simulation or with a virtual world. So those are three very separate um, approaches you could use for the labs that you, you, you presently have. So options that you may consider as you start to think about the, the labs that you have in your course. If it's about data and analyzing and then communicating those, provide the students with just data, raw data, uh, whether it's a data set from your own lab, whether it's a data set that you can get um, from archives or from other research labs internationally that have uh, epidemiological data or something of that later. So you provide the students with the data. They don't need to collect it themselves. You give it to them, then they have it. The second thing you could do is prior, uh, as the students work through what lab you want, you could pre-record the demonstration with a video. So you show students what you, you would have had them do and then ask them to critique it, analyze it, analyze the data, provide a discussion about what occurred. You could have live synchronous demonstrations with student participation. So if in your, your, in your environment, your application, you require students to be, uh, have the opportunity through or to brainstorm or to problem solve through a particular demonstration, then maybe it is uh, required in your course that it is live and synchronous. Again, with all the caveats that we spoke with, with, with Dave, in fact, that you need to be careful that uh, all students get access to it, uh, that there are times and you're mindful of accessibility. You could replace your labs now with something that the students could do at home. So if, for example, you had them come into the, the laboratory session in, in, in your you know, in your building and had them do a heart rate experiment or something to that effect. You could then recreate the experiment at home and have the student walk up and down stairs or what have you. So the idea being, is it possible for the students to actually do the experiment uh, with proper instruction uh, in their own environment? Now, that does add to the fact that you may need to, and there has been instances where you could send to students a lab kit this may have cost to it and you'd have to investigate that and sourcing and delivery. I mean, it's not simple, but it's possible that you could send to students what is required for them to actually create and um, implement the, the lab in their home environment. That's something you could consider. The last thing that you could look into, and, and I'm going to show in a moment sort of some of the resources that are available, there are lots of virtual labs and simulations that are available both free and for costs that you could implement. Specifically in the STEM uh, area, there has been a lot of work that's been done and obviously companies that have gotten involved that have lots of videos, lots of experiments, lots of simulations that you could look for. And maybe I'll get to go to the next one. So obviously you can't read this. We're going to um, provide this document as a link in the chat in a moment. It's a PDF as well as other resources. But uh, 
if you're interested and you want to investigate whether there's something that's applicable to your course and what you do in your course, uh, I would suggest that you work through some of these. We curated a little bit. Um, the first few are free uh, as you get down to BC Open Education, um, the Carl Weinman uh, experiment at the top, or as you get down to the bottom, there was some work with eCampus Ontario to investigate the four cost programs. Uh, and there's a report that's provided by your eCampus Ontario about some of those um, in order for instructors to help instructors in, in the STEM areas to make decisions about what they would use, including Labster and Beyond Labs. Um, so again, if, the, if any of these, if my suggestion is go through some of these links, uh, find out if there's something they're searchable for the most part that's useful, maybe useful to you to integrate into your course, then do so. If there's a for cost element to it, then you may want to talk to both your department head, you know, your, your the faculty office, even IT services about the support and use of some of the, the, the for cost uh, companies um, that are available. But there are lots of them. You would have to make that judgment about what would be best for you. So, I mean, I mean, this is meant to be sort of a, a summary, I think, um, and it shouldn't come as any surprise that as you start to think about labs, be clear about what it is that you wanted to accomplish with it. And you may need to modify it because you just can't do some things. Can't emphasize enough the instructions that need to go along with this so students aren't left hanging on how to do this and why. And what follows is the potential technical glitches. You need to think about, okay, if I'm gonna have these in my course, I need to make sure that this is going to work and that makes, sure, otherwise it's gonna be a night for merit for you and your TAs to field the questions that you're gonna have. Um, you're gonna need to figure out how to get the data to them. You're gonna need to figure out how to provide the resources if there is an analysis software, how to download that and provide that to your students. And then if, the, I think even as you go through this, I think we all know that if we were face-to-face -face and you were having your labs, there would be lots of communication between either students and students or students in the TA about what's going on. So as best you can, integrate that into how you're going to um, have the students do the exam. Perhaps it is they do the, the, the independently, they do the, the lab independently, but then there's a sort of an opportunity for a discussion forum after to talk about the findings and talk about what issues they had, or perhaps a synchronous Q&A as, as Carolyn suggested after to debrief and to be sure that the students have um, gleaned what you hope they had. So I'll leave that there. So I'm going to jump back in with um, an example about what I did to transition my lab um, in the spring term when we were moving to remote in March. And really the example that I'm going to talk about isn't necessarily about the content that I was able to kind of curate, but about the process that we took um, to, to get there. And so I teach an anatomy and histology course for first year students. Um, ours was already a blended course, which had a bit of an easier time to transition because some of my elements were already online. Um, but the main piece was our lab, our in-person lab um, with about 125 students every week. Um, and so the first step that we really took was to look at what on-campus resources that already existed, whether they were already digitized or whether they were something that could be digitized. Um, so whether that was photos, readings that we wanted to do in the course, some videos that we had already created, um, and anything that was already digitized was great because that was very easy for us to kind of pull. The other thing that you can look at is the library often has um, curated resources that Queen's has access to for specific disciplines. So if you visit the, the library for your particular discipline, they might have a way to point you in direction um, of some of the things that they already have available in digital format. The next thing I looked at was the supplemental web resources. So I had a bunch of um, kind of tabs in my internet that I had always saved and favorited um, for my own purpose. And they were never perfect, but they were things that I could provide to students um, as kind of an extra study uh, option for them. Um, so for me, for histology, I had a few websites that were great, um, and I passed those on to students to say, here's something that you can look at to help supplement what we're doing with the resources I've already given you. 
So the things I think that were the most important for me to think about during this transition of our labs was number one, clear directions on where students were supposed to go to find resources. And I broke it down in a chart for students to really outline what was the must use resources for the course and where the content for the assessments was going to come from and what resources were supplemental that they could use if they were struggling and needed a little bit of extra guidance on certain topics. Um, so that was extra readings I provided, some websites that they could go to to help study, um, but really clear direction on what to, was to be used for what purpose. The next was really explicit directions on how to access and use each tool. Um, this was really important because we moved online fast in March and we introduced a lot of tools that students hadn't been using throughout the year. Um, so we really went with step by step directions on how to log in or how to access each tool online. And this was really important that the TAs did not get overwhelmed with emails and on how to actually um, get the tools up and running for students. Um, so the example is the picture is a kind of a one pager document that we gave them um, for a particular in house tool that we had for histology. Um, on, on how they could navigate through the tool. The last piece was guidance on where to focus the learning and what was extras. Um, so we were really clear with them on which, which elements that they should study first um, and which elements we were testing on. Um, and I think that that was really important um, for us in the, the rapid transition, um, but it's also good practice that you might be able to carry into your course in the fall. So from labs, we'll, we'll transition into talking uh, about something a little bit different. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Lilith from the Experiential Learning Hub. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Um, because this is a slight shift, I just wanted to position the conversation around experiential learning. So um, active learning and experiential learning are closely related. As you've heard, active learning um, can be a range of things, including everything listed here and more that, that engages students in their learning process. Now, as nested within that, experiential learning is a form of active learning where there's reflection on doing. That's sort of the most oversimplified um, way to put it, um, but that's the starting point in the experiential learning hub is to ensure there's always a wraparound of, uh, of a pre and a post experience and reflection on going throughout. I forgot I didn't have control of the slides. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, so the formerly known as MTCU um, released this framework. Again, the types of experiential learning that are out there. And often we think of those in the nested bubble of work integrated learning in terms of internship and co-op. Um, but just a reminder that it is much bigger than that and includes a lot of things that can happen in your um, courses as well. Um, we actually have a project right now on interactive simulations that um, extends much beyond the healthcare setting where they're usually used um, to encourage role playing and as a way of exploring complexity and ambiguity in certain uh, learning outcomes. So. Um, this is kind of the what we think of as experiential learning, just to kind of set the stage. The experiential learning hub is in career services um, in student affairs, which is a bit of a red herring, I think, to some uh, faculty. Um, but the reason is the career development value of experiential learning opportunities. We see ourselves as the front door to experiential learning at Queen's and that's for on campus and off campus um, uh, partners. We offer consultations as I mentioned at the beginning I work largely with um, faculty program coordinators um, course instructors who are interested in um, adding or enhancing experiential learning components of their courses or programs. We also offer workshops so those pre post pieces um, that help set goals and reflect on them, as well as tools for experiential learning. And that's both for the course instructors and the students themselves. Um, the 
other than the advice on EL planning I've just described, the logistics and risk management components are ones that we heard a couple years ago were particularly challenging to navigate, and large part because the various offices um, hadn't yet coordinated. So that's something we have a streamlined referral process for to make it as easy as possible for you to ensure the, that your students are safe and supported. Um, the information sharing piece, sorry, I'm just talking slowly through the icons here, includes a host outreach network. Um, so there's sort of a network around experiential learning, and I'll talk about an event we're having next week on that, but that's something you're welcome to join. Um, it's a pretty informal network and connecting with partners. So if you're looking for uh, partners in the community or on campus even um, for the EL component, of your course, that's um, a brokerage that um, we're happy to, to offer. Thanks, Carolyn. So specifically resources, um, these are a few I wanted to highlight. So the workshops that I mentioned to help prepare students for experiential learning um, activities include one that focuses on setting goals for skill development. We actually use the Queen's Skills Cards, um, which gives language to what skills um, students might want to uh, might want to develop. And the the reason that these were developed, they're one of my favorite tools. Is that not just students, but anybody when asked what they're good at or what they want to get better at. Um, often has a hard time just articulating, coming up with that language. Um, and most often we hear students say, I guess I'm getting good at, and then they fill in the title of, of their degree, biology. Um, and so this, the 35 cards in this deck encourage them to think about collaboration and teamwork, project management, writing, creative expression. These are absolutely cross-cutting um, and ones that um, if they're able to articulate, all of a sudden, the, the door opens up for them to set goals, reflect that sort of iterative process of theory to application. Um, and then after the experience and after their degree, gives them that language um, to work toward whatever their next step might be, whether it's grad school or a job. Um, so that's a workshop that we offer quite a lot, usually tailored to the course. Professional communications that's really looking at the workplace is another one that's demand in high demand. Working remotely has been developed recently, as you can imagine, um, but we've offered that to over 100 students in the past couple of months, so that one's been um, well attended. And then the reflection and skill articulation, as I described that wraparound, is sort of the post, post experience where students are coming back and we're asking them to say, okay, um, what skills did you develop? Did you grow your proficiency in? Let's talk about some examples um, and how you can communicate those. Um, and that's encouraging their, their reflection to go um, a bit deeper and, and more critical. Um, because those need to be connected to learning outcomes, they're usually tailored to the course as well. For faculty, we offer consultations, as I've mentioned, and uh, the Supervising Students Remotely is another new workshop, um, which for those of you um, who, for whom that's, that's sort of a subset might be relevant, we actually have our last of the summer offerings is tomorrow, and you can register by emailing the uh, EL Hub address on the screen here. The Experiential Learning Faculty Toolkit, which uh, is linked here, though you can't click on your screen. Um, Carolyn has included it in the PDF she, PDF she shared in the chat. And um, that is a PDF of all of the, the resources available on our website. We encourage you to find them on our website because as Word docs, um, they're much more useful. They're the kinds of, um, of tools that are really helpful for you to download and make make use of um, actively um, for learning plans and um, assessment and uh, even logistics and curricular design up front. And uh, that's our contact and website at the bottom there. The last resource that I will mention, I think I've got it on the next slide, 
um, is around remote experiential learning. So here are a couple very quick um, kind of overarching um, ideas about everybody that has been pulled pulled up from many different people who have been working on shifting experiential learning remotely over the summer. Um, and that includes that all of a sudden you have this opportunity to partner apart from who your partner is. And that can include globally, locally, or on campus. And because everyone is in the same boat right now, we're seeing that there's an appetite for that. Um, there are courses that have happened over the summer that would have had an internship component who have successfully shifted all of their internships to being remote because organizations are still looking for um, that additional support. Um, and that includes work integrated learning options, which might be paid opportunities. People are still hiring the Queen's University or undergraduate internship program that our office administers has seen really good numbers of positions continuing. Um, and that's un unlike co-op maybe because they're shorter term, but um, because QIP is 12 to 16 months, they've seen really good retention. So just a note of hope there. Um, as Andy mentioned, there's a lot of great practices out there for, for shifting virtual labs and field courses to be virtual. And um, you hear about like culinary arts programs, shipping food boxes to people. We won't be doing that, but um, I kind of wish someone would do it for me some nights. Um, and then ensuring equitable access is another thing that's come up a couple of times already today, but um, needs to be constantly um, focused on and um, we've integrated through our resources as well. And a reminder to focus on quality. I think there's a, a knee jerk reaction often to try and do the most or do everything you once did. Um, and the uh, the response instead, I think, should be to return to those learning outcomes and really focus on what you need students to get out of this and make that learning as quality as possible. So these were just some highlights pulled from an article linked here. Uh, but uh, on the next slide, if that. Um, Lily, if I may, before we go on, there was a, there was a question yeah, from Katie Marie. Oh, sorry. In the I chat, and she wanted to know if the skills know. cards would be available outside of the physical office for instructors to help students articulate their skills. Yes, yeah, so we've actually got 100 decks in the office right now. Our career counseling team are responsible for distributing them, um, but they are now online. So I can share the link to the, uh, maybe in follow up to this, the link to the online version. And that website is being updated, updated constantly with different activities. Um, there's a facilitator's guide that's almost ready to go public and uh, it's a lot of fun to I forced my mom and sister to set New Year's resolutions with it last December and uh, it's it's a great tool for all sorts of purposes. Um, the last thing I'll just mention here is that we do have um, a lunch and learn that's going to go more deeply into remote experiential learning next Tuesday. Um, over lunch on Zoom. You can register by emailing me at el.hub. And uh, I'll go more depth into guiding principles as well as um, Mark Hostetler from Devs 410, an internship course that um, the internship component has run over the summer, will um, provide a case study and then there'll be a QA and discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and right. next, sorry, I'm passing it on here to Ruth. She's going to give uh, an example right now about experiential learning at the desk. Hello. Yes. So um, at the BISC, um, we do follow the model of the EL Hub, but we have, because of the specific characteristics of the castle, we have it adapted uh, to basically um, using course learning outcomes and content as part as, as as the core content of our experiential learning opportunities following an, an active learning strategy. So um, since uh, March, we've been developing this sort of from EL to VL campaign, which is from experiential learning to virtual experiential learning campaign. 
And as, as an example of how we've done this, I just want to run very quickly through uh, the different steps we've created and what are the results that we're starting to see. So we started initially with um, a compilation and a, and a, and a study of um, enormous amount of uh, virtual experiential learning um, sources and literature and also virtual teaching and learning. So we had different people from different offices coming together. So I was I, I, I pulled resources together with the um, students at Success Coordinator and Learning Development. And um, then once we knew how we could move our own um, experiential learning model uh, virtually then created a set of guidelines, a uh, set of best practice, and also a timeline of how we want faculty uh, to do this transition and how we uh, can support faculty in doing this transition. At the same time, we started creating, creating quite a large database of um, experiential learning opportunities uh, organized by disciplines. So we have close to 200 different um, um, opportunities that could be used for our by our faculty to to, to start designing to, to get ideas to design experiential learning uh, uh, components for the courses in September. Uh, we also created um, examples of virtual experiential learning opportunities. Uh, we created teaching units um, so faculty could actually see and. Uh, adapt those things to their own specific, uh, to their own specific um, subject. We've also had um, over the month of June um, a number of one-to-one -one sessions with faculty where we were discussing these guidelines, this best practice, this uh, these basic ideas uh, of how to transition uh, from the from the physical to the virtual world. And we also have um, organized some synchronous learning sessions that um, are designed to accompany what the CTL is doing because the CTL is a great resource for us um, and very often um, some of our questions are more related to how to adapt the CTL tips and information specifically to the basic example. So we've had some synchronous sessions in doing that and in also in getting the faculty really know well and master and make the most of the virtual learning platforms so they can use it to, to, their full, to the full extent. Um, for this process that we are in, what has been key for us has been uh, having a really intense um, staff and faculty collaboration. Um, we've had, even if we had all of us were compiling or creating guidelines or uh, looking for resources in different places, we had input from um, other people, we had people input from staff, um, we had faculty, for instance, that were attending the, uh, the webinars, taking notes and then sharing those notes with the rest of faculty that could not attend. Um, we also have a number of faculty that teach in other institutions and they've been really, um, really uh, great in sharing with us what they've learned and the lessons that they, what it has worked with for them, what, what hasn't worked for them, etc., etc. And all that is creating a couple of um, Big, or a couple of things that, that, that as, as a result so far. One is, or the first one, is that up to uh, March in the best, we had a very specific model of experiential learning where we had two ELOs, two experiential learning opportunities per term, per course, and that was our model. And we're going to see now is that we're going to see a variety of virtual experiential learning options. We're going to see courses where experiential learning is going to become the core and center of the course and other courses where experiential learning is going to take uh, a, a maybe a much more active learning form divided into smaller units into smaller elements that can be worked on in a weekly or bi-weekly um, basis but all of these different options what they share is that experiential learning is now an umbrella concept for the course delivery so it's connected with the vast majority of the learning outcomes for the course um, is not connected to just one or two or three of the um, elements of the course material, but it's connected to the majority of the of the of the um, issues in the course, you know, the, the elements in the course material. So it has become this um, overarching um, um, concept uh, for us. It, it's always been a key part of our pedagogy, but it's, it's now 
uh, we've seen that virtual experience of learning is actually an opportunity to develop something that can live beyond these times we're living in. And we're uh, thinking about creating a future blended model where the virtual world and the physical world are actually um, combining so we can have a much more in-depth uh, uh, use of um, active learning and experiential learning. Um, uh, um, and students can have a much more in-depth um, um, reflection uh, on, on the issues that they, 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 they work with uh, when in experiential learning. So um, um, if we go on to the next slide, um, just very quickly, I put here a very simple, very simplified example of what uh, one of our um, VLOs or VL teaching units would uh, look like. And all of them uh, would respond to a series of principles, which are principles you can actually see um, underlying anything that the webinars and the CTL have been have been um, going through. This is th uh, keeps things simple, um, lean towards asynchronous, asynchronous learning, slow things down, uh, try not to use too many technologies because uh, you know, uh, if you use too many technologies in your own course, that means students might end up having like 15, 12 or 15 different technologies in the different courses that they'll be taking. Trust the students because um, also the experience has shown us that students actually rise up to the challenge and they become a great source of support as well for faculty when we are in, in difficult times like this and also be attentive and responding, uh, responsive to those who struggle and build time and space uh, to create structures to respond to those students who struggle. So um, the example that you have on the on the right of the screen is a, an example of a VLO, or a virtual experiential learning opportunity. If this had been an ELO in the past, just a, a physical experiential learning opportunity, probably this would have been developed over maybe two or three weeks. Uh, but by moving it online, we actually you actually start seeing how you need to build those windows of time to develop every single step of the of the process. So you need to pay attention to the introduction of the activity. Um, to um, you know, you need to um, learn about how your students or what are your students' interests. You need to really explain how you want them to uh, treat the activity, to take notes, to deal with it, etc. Uh, they need to have time to actually do the visit. In this case, would be a visit to a virtual gallery. Um, and as is, this is going to be delivered in an asynchronous way, not all of them are going to be available to do this, the, the activity at the same time. So you need to build, you need to create a window of time for this. And this would be um, following uh, the model um, of the experiential learning cycle. This would be the actual, the concrete experience that they'll be that they'll be uh, using as, as the starting point of the, of the experiential learning reflection. Then the reflection comes afterwards, probably in the following week, through um, a, a discussion that could be synchronous or asynchronous. Probably asynchronous is, is more is easier. Um, you can always spice things up with little synchronous sessions. And so, um, and then it comes the uh, moment of the creation of abstract concepts where they are actually going to apply the experience to the course material that they that they have been learning about that they've been working with uh, for the term, and they create those as they 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 build those abstract concepts and they uh, present them. They prepare a good presentation. They deliver the presentation, and finally uh, the last the last part of the exercise. Uh, uh, which is also a key part of it, is the, the time and the space for debrief and feedback where they can actually see how to um, actively re uh, or uh, experiment, experiment again uh, with those skills they've acquired or that knowledge they've been working with in a completely different scenario that could be a different gallery, a different, uh, a different scenario, then it's not, it's not the one they've been working with up until this moment. So with that, you'll be um, sort of closing the circle of the experiential, the, the experiential learning circle. And as I say, this is a very, very simple, simplified example, but this is what it would look like roughly from the outside. Um, and um, just to finish very quickly, I'd just like to say that um, I, I am 
mindful that the model of experience of learning of the castle has always been is 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 perfect for the castle because of our size and our and our class sizes, um, and it's always been challenging to implement in main campus, but thanks to the virtual world, I think that is maybe an opportunity for larger groups, for larger classes to actually start um, incorporating experiential learning as a greater part, as a more important part of their course delivery, uh, whether in class or out of class. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, um, I'm at the desk to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Okay, so, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, as we as we talk about our next steps, I want to encourage anyone that has a question that we haven't yet answered to pop their question into the chat box so that we do have a chance to answer any other questions um, that come up. Andy, okay. well, go ahead. You can talk about next steps. Go ahead. All right. So some of the next steps that we have are about uh, checking out the CTL's Transforming Teaching Toolkit. This is a section of our website that has a ton of different resources um, on a, on different topics on teaching and learning. You can also book a consultation and talk about your course specifically with someone at the CTL, or if it's about experiential learning, you can contact uh, the EL Hub. Uh, talk to your faculty embedded unit. So if you're in a faculty that has uh, contact people for teaching and learning, reach out to them and see if they have ideas about what others in your faculty might be doing and what you can do for your own course. Um, attending Course Design Express. So this is a program the CTL is offering uh, online this summer. There's two more iterations happening in July um, to help you think about your course as a whole and what elements of your course you might be redesigning. Or this remote uh, experiential learning lunch and learn, uh, which is happening next week. And there's an upcoming webinar in August about supporting and leveraging your teaching assistants. So I would say this is specifically for labs or seminar courses where you have questions about how you might use your TAs and what resources you can provide to your TAs. Um, to help facilitate the transition to remote instruction. Andy, do you have anything to add? I'm cognizant that we haven't. Yeah. No, no, I have nothing to add. And, you know, again, at, at the end of the day, this is sort of a, an overview and, and I think a specific conversation about one's course and what you're trying to achieve, uh, we're happy to help with or others in other units would be happy to help with. So please reach out. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Does anyone have any questions that they feel are still burning questions about your own course or that we haven't had a chance to answer yet? That's a resounding quiet. <laughs> so keep in mind, once again, we've recorded this uh, this session. It will be uploaded to the YouTube channel that's linked off of the um, the CTL uh, homepage. The resource sheet, which has been linked in the chat, will also be available somewhere there. Uh, if not, you can. this link will always exist within the chat, um, so you can go back and use it there, as well as the link for the skills card. Anything else to add, Carolyn, Ruth, or Lilith? No, thank you so much, though. Thank well, you very much all. as well. With that, everybody have a good day or afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. For everyone still on the call, if you see Caitlin just posted an evaluation in our chat, if you have a chance to take a look at that, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. And Caitlin, when you have a chance, you can go ahead and turn off our recording.